Thank you so much, everyone. That was myself back in 2011, when what we call it the most popular uprising in Bahrain history erupted a place which is considered to be very much inconvenient for many governments, mainly for a lot of Western governments in particular, which have massive interest with Bahrain. I'm talking about Bahrain, a very tiny country, which is the host of the US 5th Fleet. The UK government has its own investment within that country. And it's a place which a lot of the Western champion, when the Arab Spring erupted the Arab world, this was one of the uncovered, the least, the least covered one, and the most unpopular one as well, an inconvenient one. Uh, so taking part in this, in this protest movement, and for the very same interview which was just screened, I was put on a trial by a military court. If someone doesn't know what it means to be there at military court, I would like just to testify what happened to me at the corridors of this is what we call it military court. I was there where policemen were enjoying one thing, which is abusing us, humiliating us, to an extent where the memory, I could see it is still live in my head, to say, what could get worse? Those individuals, those police, the only difference between the main court where you're going to face the judge was a door. And those policemen were telling us, I wish you're going to be sentenced to death. Another one say, well, I hope this is the last time you're going to see your family. It was the most pathetic, humiliating thing. And then, without any understanding what the hell is going on, I have to face a judge. For less than five minutes, then I got to be sentenced for a year imprisonment. And my sin, the crime I committed there, it was participating in what I would call it a pro-democracy movement. That's something that I strongly believe in. I was punished for it. And subsequently, I was severely tortured, beaten, sexually harassed. And I served my time in the prison. For safety reason, I decided to leave Bahrain. And I fled to the United Kingdom to claim political asylum. I was granted, and I started my organization, the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, to deliver a message that those people which I was sharing cell with, those are my friends, those are fighting the very same fight I was fighting. I was let out from the hook. So I have to continue that struggle. I have to, to, to be a voice for those which are voiceless in Bahrain. For doing so, in 2015, in particular in 2014, I was taking an advocacy trip to visit a number of states, mainly European states, with my friend and colleague Nabil Rajab, to tell the world what it means to be in Bahrain prisons, to tell them this is a human rights defender with the Europeans would stay who are the champion to protect the human rights defenders. To tell them about the death penalty cases, with, again, the Europeans would claim the same. But when it comes into a case like Nabil Rajab, someone who is very well known by the international community, Human Rights Watch, have him on their advisory board for the MENA. He is the, used to be the Deputy Secretary, Secretary General for FIDH, someone who is highly respected. And the UN declared him to be, you were working group on arbitrary detention, declared him to be someone who is arbitrary detained. Someone, if, if there is a clear case, there isn't any clearer case than an active human rights defender who was a voice for the voiceless and taking all the chances. So he was punished to be imprisoned, and his job was to share his experience. When he returned back, he was immediately arrested. 24 hours it took, and he was arrested. And since then, he ne was never able to leave the country. And as we speak, he's now facing 18 years imprisonment for a series of tweets for interviews he conducted with, on the media, with the media, and today is one of the days which he's going to have a trial on. I'm glad to see, like, further than this, I mean, just to, to, to move on, uh, Nabil returned home, so he was arrested. I returned to the UK because that's where I'm residing. And then without, it was on 31st of January 2015, 
I saw my name was listed on Bahia News Agency among 72 individuals. If your name was listed among this list, it means you are no longer Bahraini. And if you don't have any other citizenship, it means effectively you are stateless. This is how I find out about it. There isn't anything called the due process. It was just something posted on Bahrain News Agency. I thought there would be an, an outcry, what I would call international outcry to this. But honestly, this happened without any serious consequences by the international community. I don't want to go into history. I just wanted to talk about events in 2017 in particular, which I believe a lot of what I would call them red lines being crossed. The same military court which, I, which sentenced me, and I know what it means to, they now being re-empowered to trial civilians. Those civilians, they claim that they are trying people which are related to terrorism cases. But I'm going to tell you who, is, who are the terrorists in Bahrain. Abdelhad al Khawaja is one of the terrorists, according to the government of Bahrain. He is the most and one of the most prominent human rights defenders within the entire region, someone who served within the frontline defenders, a well respected organization based in Ireland. And currently, as I speak, Abdel Hadi is serving life imprisonment. Someone who is which the work, UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention declared him to be arbitrary detained. This is the military court which sentenced Abdel Hadi al Khawaja. The same military court which sentenced at least 47 doctors to 15 years imprisonment for one crime, treating the wounded protesters, journalists, bloggers, everyone who was distanced to the Bahraini government and who stood against the government of Bahrain was sentenced by that court. And this is where it comes into the UPR recommendation, making sure that the, 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 they should stop this trial against civilians. Now Bahrain is turning into what is called de facto martial state. We live in under undeclared martial st uh, state. Look into the village of Duraz, and there is one of the most recent victim, Mustaf Hamdan, an 18 years old boy, which just received a bullet in his head. And the, the story is not just outrageous, it's also because no one from the state is taking responsibility. I'm not talking about 2011, I'm talking about this year. The National Security Agency being re-empowered, and they were given the power to arrest individuals. Those, this is the same body which are responsible in murdering Karim Fakhrawi and other individuals under torture. And this is all well documented within BICI. The only difference, in 2011, when the military court trial doctors and the human rights defenders, I've seen states which were condemning that action. As a matter of fact, William Haig used to be the, foreman, uh, the former uh, foreign secretary of the UK government. He condemned that court, only to find out Britain is now currently providing a training to the very same military judge who sentenced me and sentenced hundreds of individuals to provide them with assistance to investigate into the war crimes which are committed in Yemen. So they are putting their full faith into the very same abusers, and this is the problem. If someone wants to, and wants to understand the struggle in Bahrain, it's very simple. Look into Yemen conflict, where it's a humanitarian disaster. No one wants to talk about it. Even this a Human Rights Council failed to issue, to do, deliver the, the minimum, which set up an investigative committee to investigate into crimes by all sides. Because Saudi Arabia was part of this conflict, and because they brought at least 20 billions from the US government because they are also like received more than 3.3 billion from the UK government worth of arms, then it's very much inconvenient for the UK and for the US to support anything which would condemn their ally. So what is the impunity? The impunity starts from this place. When states could get away with things, they could, the most recent thing was just on 2nd of March when my, when my brother-in-law, I'm just going to say this and I'm going to end it from here. In October 2016, I took part in a protest against the King of Bahrain when he was visiting Theresa May in the UK. I was arrested for a few seconds, for a few minutes by the British police because I thrown myself at his car and then we continue to shout against the dictator of Bahrain. I took that action and I was aware what would be the consequences. In Britain, you have the right to practice, you, you protest, it's all fine. <clears throat> I was willing to live with any consequences if it leads to an arrest, it leads to anything, 
I took that action and I'm was, I was ready to take any consequences. The last thing I was expected, on the same day, my wife and my infant son were, were about to leave Bahrain to come to me to the UK. Guess what happened? My wife was beaten, was mistreated, was interrogated for at least seven hours. Seven hours interrogated and she was told, we're going to get the animal, your husband, and he is going to pay not only for yourself, but we're going to start by your family and by his family and we're going to get you one by one to this place, to the very same interrogation room. It's fortunate to have my son to be a, a U.S. citizen and to have the U.S. Embassy to put its full weight with the diplomatic level, with everything. A few minutes, it's, it, was, it took like four days and the entire thing because of the massive media attention, because of a lot of things, and because of the role of the U.S. as well, my wife was able to come back to me to London. But the story didn't end here. Just last week, my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, as I speak, they are currently detained. And the last thing I heard from my mother-in-law, it was a phone call to say, it was a phone call from her son to tell her, my mom, I've been tortured at the criminal investigation directorate. I, I, was, I was forced to confess against you and they told me they will bring you to the same place I'm, I'm located in. And they told me they will take their revenge from my sister's husband referring to me. So this is what it takes for me to come to the Human Rights Council, to speak about human rights abuses. Before it was me paying the price, but now my family is paying the price. Only to find out what I believed in, what I put my faith in, to sacrifice. They failed to do the least. The least is to put Bahrain under scrutiny to stand up on what I would call it a joint statement, which at least would sit something on the record, that the international community could sit something together. But for what? I think, honestly, and this might be the last time I'm going to be at the Human Rights Council, if the Human Rights Committee just failed us during the most repressive time, then why we are here? And that's the question I ask it to every single state which attended here. Thank you very much. Sharing their experiences um, so, so powerfully. Um, ben, I've heard, heard your, uh, your narrative on this before and it's, um, it's, it's an important one to, uh, to reflect on and to ensure that, um, that our uh, motivations in Bahrain don't have an unintended consequences in the way in which you've uh, explained. We, we have analyzed this and we, we don't agree with your assessments, your analysis, but, um, but appreciate you sharing it with us, uh, with us again. I mean, for the record, you know, we have an, a, 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 a track record of constructive engagement with the, with the government of Bahrain where we express our concerns both privately and publicly. Um, sometimes we find it better to talk privately, sometimes we find it better to talk publicly. But I think you know, the, the title for this event was Bahrain at the UPR, and I think focusing on how we can target and focus our recommendations for the next UPR is a really important and constructive way to, uh, to do this. Um, so with that, thank you again for, uh, for, for raising your, uh, your concerns and sharing your experiences. Thanks. But also I know from, from talking to another, a number of other human rights organizations that uh, the response that we often receive, which is an incorrect one, uh, when we, we talk about these kinds of things and the negative impact that the, the UK is having in Bahrain, uh, is a response which basically says, well, you would rather that uh, you know, Western governments or the UK or, or whomever didn't engage in Bahrain at all and that uh, you know, there was uh, no attempt whatsoever toward uh, supporting reform efforts. And that's not true. Uh, you know, we, certainly we think that the ideas, theoretically, behind these bodies that the UK is seeking to, to train and promote in Bahrain are good ones. We all want Bahrain to have competent torture investigators that are you know, independent from the state and do their jobs properly. Uh, the problem is, this is not a good faith effort on the part of the Bahraini government 
And I think anybody would be hard pressed to say that after five years of the UK supporting this effort, based on the performance of these bodies and the incredibly extensive information about that performance that has been presented to the UK government uh, by human rights organizations, um, I think to say that that the, these bodies are, are, are not having uh, a negative effect now um, is, is not really supported by the facts. And I would just, I would just emphasize that, as I said in my remarks, uh, what we're really calling for is for Bahrain to take some steps that are binding towards ending torture, uh, such as ratifying the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and allowing the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture to visit the country. Uh, I think that those are incredibly reasonable requests um, that it's, it's pretty hard to quibble with, but I would, I would uh, emphasize the fact that the British government uh, has repeatedly refused to make any such requests uh, attached to its assistance in Bahrain. It won't make any of its assistance to these bodies conditional uh, on Bahrain taking <clears throat> any of those kind of binding steps uh, even five years after the fact. So I think that's uh, where the problem lies at this point from our perspective. Thank you, Min. You want we, I mean, as you know, we are... Uh we are very much concerned uh, with the human rights situation. I think the, the job you are doing, the organizations are doing, is very important to flag uh, violations so that we, are all, we can all take note of and, uh, and take action if required. Um, what I wanted to say regarding the, um, the action at the Human Rights Council, um, you mentioned some of the bilateral activities between Switzerland and Bahrain. Um, I think the assessment um, on the action of the Human Rights Council to link it only to the bilateral uh, dimension falls short because it has never been a statement of Switzerland. It was always a joint statement by a number of countries. So I think it's very important to underline that it, it was a joint activity under uh, Swiss guidance, but still it was something in the multi multilateral where we all are in responsibility to act. <laughs> so, just for the record, thank you so much. Based on the UPR recommendation, I think there are most of the issues in 2012 were focused on what's, what BICI or the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry findings and their 26 recommendations. Those were the core of most of the recommendation. However, post 2011, 2012, the issue of revocation of citizenship is something really huge. We talk about at least 350 individuals which uh, since 2012 which been revoked from their citizenship. Most of them are stateless. So the statelessness is, is now is a, is, a, is a serious problem post 2012. Uh, the other thing is the, what, the persecution against the, uh, against the Shia clerics within Bahrain, and what the five UN uh, special rapporteur would call it as, as a systematic harassment against the Shia population in Bahrain. So this is uh, another topic which was a quite recent development post 2016 and post the revocation of citizenship of Ayatollah Sheikh Isa Qasim. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's it for now.